the Vedic age, 2500 BCE to 600 BCE. The coming of the Aryans. The Harappan civilization started to stagnate by 1500 BCE. Around this time, the Aryans began to arrive in India. Historians believe that the Aryans were a cultured race of people who lived in Central Asia. As their population grew, they had to move out of their homeland to look for new pastures for their animals and places to live. Some of them migrated to India and came to be known as the Indo-Aryans. The Aryans came to India in stages and gradually settled in the Gangetic Plains. The Phases of the Vedic Period There are two main phases of the Vedic Period. The Early Vedic Period, 1500 BCE to 1000 BCE, and the Later Vedic Period, 1000 BCE to 600 BCE. During the Early Vedic Period, the Aryans settled in the Sapta Sindhu region and called it Brahmavarta, or Land of the Gods. In the Later Vedic Period, the Aryans moved to the Gangetic Valley and named it Aryavarta, or Land of the Aryans. Vedic Literature The religious literature of the Aryans are known as the Vedas. There are four Vedas, Rig Ved, Atharva Ved, Samaved and Yajur Ved. These texts were composed verbally and passed down orally from generation to generation till they were finally written down. Brahman, the Upanishads, the Puran and the two epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata, are the other important religious texts of the Aryans. These books are collectively known as the Vedic literature. They tell us a great deal about the social, religious, economic and political life of the people during this period. Political Organization During the early Vedic period, the Aryans organized themselves into tribes called Jalna. Each Janna consisted of many villages called Gram. The head of the Gram was the Gramani. The head of all the tribes was the Rajan or king who protected the tribe from the enemy. The Sabha and the Samiti were two councils which advised and guided the king. He was also assisted by the Purohi, religious advisor, and the Senani, commander-in-chief of the army. During the later Vedic period, the small tribes grew into large kingdoms. The king became very powerful and kingship became hereditary. The king was resisted by many officials who were in charge of different departments. Many rituals and sacrifices or yagnas like the Rajasuya Yagni and the Ashwamedh Yagni were performed to confer supreme power on the king. Classification of society The Aryan society was divided into four classes or Varnas on the basis of people's occupation. The four Varnas were Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. Brahmanas were priests and scholars. Kshatriyas were warriors. Vaishyas were farmers, traders and craftspeople. Shudras were laborers who did menial jobs. The classification of society into four Varnas became rigid and hereditary in the later Vedic period. The four classes came to be known as castes. One's caste was determined by birth, and a person born in a particular caste could not change his profession or caste. The four Ashram The life of an Aryan was divided into four stages or Ashram. Brahmacharya was the first stage, when a person stayed with his guru and received education. Grihast was the second stage, when a person married and led the life of a householder. Vanaprast 
was the third stage when one gave up worldly life and went to the forest to meditate. Sannyas was the last stage when one became an ascetic. Economic Life of the Aryans In the early Vedic period, the Aryans, who were nomads, began to settle down. They practiced agriculture and reared livestock. Other than those involved with agriculture, there were also chariot makers, potters, leather workers and weavers. By the later Vedic period, the Aryans led a settled life. Agriculture became their main occupation. They improved their farming implements and became prosperous. The towns and cities grew during this period, trade developed by the barter system. During this time, many people used painted grey vessels, which have been found in many sites in northern India. Religion The Aryans used to worship one supreme power who created the universe. They also worshipped the forces of nature in the forms of gods and goddesses. The most important god was Indra, the god of rain and thunder. Other gods were Varuna, the god of water, and Surya, the sun god. During the early Vedic period, there were no idols or temples. They worshipped their gods in the open. The yagnas were performed by the brahmanas and all the family members participated. In the later Vedic period, the earlier gods lost their importance. Brahma, the creator, Shrit, the destroyer, and Vishnu, the preserver, now gained importance. The mode of worship became complex and many elaborate ceremonies and rituals were performed. Buddhism and Jainism. By the end of the later Vedic period, many evil practices crept into society in the name of religion. The religion became complex, the Brahmanas became very powerful and exploited the common people through the various rites and rituals that they introduced. The lower caste people were discriminated against. Two preachers, Vartaman Mahavir and Gautam Buddha, started reform movements to weed out the problems that had come into society in the name of religion. Jainism The 24th and last Pete Kankar teacher of the Jains was Vardhaman Mahavir. He was born a prince in 599 BCE near Vaishali. At the age of 30, he gave up his life of luxury in search of the truth. After 12 years of penance and meditation, he gained spiritual knowledge. He became the Jinnah or the conqueror of the self. His philosophy is known as Jainism and his followers are called Jains. Mahavira preached non-violence or ahimsa. The Jains do not believe in harming any living creature. Mahavira did not believe in the existence of God and opposed all religious rites and rituals. He believed that all people are equal. Mahavira died at the age of 72 in 468 BCE in Pavapuri in Bihar. Buddhism Siddharth, later known as Gautam Buddha, was born in Lumbini near Kapilavastu in 567 BCE. He was a prince, married to Princess Yashodhara, and had a son named Rahul. One day, Siddharth saw an old man, a sick man, a dead body, and an ascetic. 
He was deeply saddened by these sights, which changed his life completely. At the age of 29, he left his home in search of truth. After six years, while meditating under a people tree in Bodh Gaya, he attained enlightenment and became the Buddha. He gave his first sermon at the Deer Park in Sarnath. Buddha's religious philosophy is called Buddhism and those who follow the teachings of Buddhism are known as Buddhists. Teachings of Buddhism The main tenets of Buddhism are contained in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Four Noble Truths The world is full of suffering. The cause of suffering is human desire. Suffering ends when human desire is overcome. If desire is conquered, one can attain nirvana or freedom from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Eightfold Path Right Belief Right Speech Right means of livelihood, right memory, right thought, right action, right effort, right meditation. Buddha taught people to lead a simple life and follow Ahimsa. He did not believe in caste system. Buddhist viharas and monuments are found in many places. His followers travelled from place to place to spread his teachings. Buddha died in 483 BCE at the age of 80. The Mauryan Empire, 4th century BCE to 2nd century BCE. The Mauryan Dynasty. For the first time in Indian history, by the 4th century BCE, a large empire was built in India under the Mauryans. The Mauryan Empire politically unified a large part of the country. The two main sources of information on the Mauryan period are Indica by Megasthenes and Arthashastra by Chanakya. The rock and pillar edicts of Ashoka provide valuable information as well. Chandragupta Maurya The first king of the Mauryan dynasty was Chandragupta Maurya. In 322 BCE, he overthrew the last Nanda king, Dhananda, and seized the throne of Magadha. Chandragupta Maurya's success was due to his advisor, Chanakya or Kautilya, who was a wise Brahman scholar. Chandragupta Maurya freed northwestern India from Greek control. Chandragupta Maurya was an able and ambitious ruler. He built a vast empire stretching from Hindu Kush in the west to Bengal in the east and from the Himalayas in the north to Narmada in the south. Chandragupta Maurya was succeeded by his son Bindusara. During his reign, Bindusara expanded the empire up to Mysore. He was succeeded by his son Ashoka. Ashoka. Ashoka ascended the throne in 273 BCE. At that time, a powerful kingdom, Kalinga, was not under Mauryan control. Kalinga controlled the land and sea routes to South India and Southeast Asia. Ashoka attacked Kalinga in 261 BCE and conquered it after a bitter struggle. The Mauryan Empire reached the height of its political power 
disturbing Ashoka's rule. It stretched from the Hindu Kush in the west to Brahmaputra in the east and from the Himalayas in the north to Mysore in the south. It also included Kabul, Kandhar, Nepal and Kashmir. Kalinga War and its Impact The Kalinga War, however, became a turning point in Ashoka's life. The death and destruction in this war filled him with remorse. Deeply influenced by the Buddhist teachings of peace, non-violence and compassion, Ashoka embraced Buddhism and devoted his life to the welfare of its subjects. Ashoka replaced the policy of Big Vijaya, conquest of territories, with Dhamma Vijaya, conquest through Dharma. Ashoka's Dhamma Dhamma is derived from the Sanskrit word Dharma, meaning religious duty. The main principles of Dhamma were People should live in peace and harmony. Ahimsa or non-violence and non-injury to all living creatures should be followed by all. People should love one another and respect other religions. Children should obey their elders and the elders should treat the children with understanding. People should be understanding and kind to all people, including servants and slaves. Propagation of Dhamma Ashoka dedicated the rest of his life to spreading the message of Buddha. Ashoka constructed many Buddhist monasteries and stupas throughout the kingdom. Ashoka sent learned scholars to distant lands to spread Buddhism. He sent his son Mahindra and daughter Sanghamitra to Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism. Ashoka organized the third Buddhist council at Pataliputra to discuss ways of propagating Buddhism. Ashokan Edicts Edicts are royal commands or proclamations. They were inscribed on rocks, polished stone pillars and caves. These edicts were composed in Prakrit, which was the language of the people. In the northwest regions, they were written in Greek, Kharoshti and Aramaic. Ashokan edicts are a valuable source of information about the Mauryan period. The Mauryan administration The supreme power was held by the king. He was advised by a council of ministers called the Mantri Parishad. The empire was divided into provinces. The provinces were divided into nagars or towns and grams or villages. The capital city of the Mauryan Empire was Pataliputra. There was an elaborate spy system which informed the king of the happenings inside and outside the kingdom. The Mauryan kings had a large, well-equipped standing army, which included infantry, cavalry, chariots and a navy. The Mauryan Art The Mauryan period was an age of cultural brilliance. The artistic achievements of this period can be seen in the numerous stupas, monolithic pillars, caves and sculpted figures of the Ashoka period. Some of the more famous works of art include the Stupa at Sanchi and the Sarnath Pillar with the Lion Capital. Some of these symbols have now been adopted by India and can be found on the flag and currency notes. Mauryan economy. The Mauryan rulers unified the country and brought peace and stability. 
These favorable conditions promoted the growth of the economy and made the empire rich and prosperous. Agriculture was the main occupation of the Morvians. Trade and commerce flourished. Overseas trade was carried on it with Sri Lanka, Egypt and Greece. Decline of the Morvian Empire The death of Ashoka in 232 BCE marked the beginning of the decline of the Morvian Empire. After Ashoka, his successors were weak and ineffective. The last Morvian emperor, Brihadrat, was killed by Pushyamitra Sangha, the founder of the Sangha dynasty. This brought an end to the rule of one of the most glorious dynasties in the history of ancient India. The Turkish Invasion and Delhi Sultanate, 1001 CE to 1526 CE. The Turkish Invasion, the disintegration of the Abbasid Empire in West Asia led to the emergence of several independent states. These states were ruled by Turks, who had earlier served in the armies of the Caliphs. The two important states established by the Turks were Ghazni and Ghor. Mehmud Ghazni Sultan Mehmud of Ghazni was a powerful and ambitious ruler. He invaded India 17 times between 1001 to 1025 CE. He wanted to build a large empire and needed the money to raise a powerful army to succeed. The fabulous riches of the temples of North India attracted him and he plundered its riches. He managed to succeed because of the mutual rivalries between the Rajputs in North India. Mahmud's important raids. Mahmud first defeated Jaipal, whose territory extended from Punjab to modern Afghanistan, 1001 CE. He then defeated Jaipal's son, Anandpal, and his allies in 1008 CE. These raids proved to be destructive. After 1010 CE, Mahmud attacked temple towns as temples were treasure troves of fabulous riches. Mahmud attacked and plundered Nagarkot, Kangra, in 1009 CE, Thaneshwar, 1014 CE, Mathura and Kanauj, 1018 to 1019 CE. Hundreds of temples were plundered and destroyed. Mahmud's chief aim was to loot and plunder and not establish political control in India. The plunder of Somnath. Mahmud's most ambitious and profitable expedition was his attack on the Somnath temple in Kathiawar in 1025 CE. Mahmud returned to his capital with immense treasures. Mahmud's attack exposed the weakness of the northern states of India and paved the way for the conquest of India. After his death, the Ghaznavid Empire collapsed.
Muhammad Ghori was from the kingdom of Ghor in northwestern Afghanistan. He decided to conquer India and enrich his kingdom with India's wealth. In 1191 CE, Ghori attacked Prithviraj Chauhan, the Rajput ruler of Delhi and Ajmer. Prithviraj defeated Ghori in the first battle of the Rhine. Mamluk Dynasty After Muhammad Ghori returned to Ghor, his viceroys Qutbuddin Ebak and Muhammad bin Bakhtiyar Khalji expanded the Ghori Empire. Ghori died in 1206 CE. The viceroys appointed by Ghori soon declared themselves independent. Qutbuddin Ebak took control of the Indian possessions and laid the foundations of the Delhi Sultanate. This dynasty, founded by Ebak, also came to be known as the Mamluk dynasty. Ebak was known to be a generous and kind ruler. In his reign, which spanned four years, he built mosques and also started building the Qutub Minar. Iltutmish Qutbuddin died in an accident in 1210 CE. His son who succeeded him was replaced by his son-in-law, Iltutmish. Iltutmish was a capable ruler. Iltutmish stabilized his position and introduced significant changes in the finance and revenue sectors. He minted gold and silver coins. He completed the Qutub Minar and was a patron of art and learning. Ilkutmish nominated his daughter Razia to succeed him. Razia Sultan and Balban Razia Sultan ruled for three years. She was a brave and just woman. She led her armies to war and dealt with rebel leaders firmly. Though she married one of the rebel leaders, she could not manage to take back the throne of Delhi. Ghiasuddin Balban was a prominent leader of the rebel faction. He ruled the Sultanate for 20 years on behalf of Nasiruddin, a weak and inexperienced Sultan. Balban ascended the throne of Delhi as a Sultan in 1266 CE. He ruled with an iron fist and made the monarchy all-powerful. He strengthened the army and established a spy system. The state was economically prosperous during his reign because of peace and stability. Khilji Dynasty After the end of the Mamluk dynasty, the Khiljis came to power. The dynasty was founded by Jalaluddin Khilji in 1290 CE. He was brutally murdered by his nephew, Alauddin Khilji, in 1296 CE. Alauddin Khilji. During his reign, Alauddin Khilji managed to extend the boundaries of the empire up to the Deccan. The empire reached its heights at this time. Alauddin Khilji's reforms. Other than expansion and conquests, Alauddin Khilji's period also saw a number of reforms. He asserted control over the nobility. He reorganized the army and had an elaborate spy network. Alauddin Khilji introduced revenue reforms and also regulated the prices of commodities. He was a great patron of art and learning. Amir Khusro, the famous poet was a member of his court. The Tughlaq Dynasty The period of Alauddin Khilji's rule was followed by political turmoil. After the decline of the Khilji dynasty, Ghiasuddin Tughlaq founded the Tughlaq Dynasty in 1320 CE. He restored peace and stability to the state. Muhammad bin Tughlaq. After Ghiasuddin's death, his son Muhammad bin Tughlaq 
ascended the throne in 1325 CE. He was a diligent ruler and undertook many projects. These projects were brilliantly conceived but poorly executed. Muhammad bin Tughlaq's schemes. He heavily taxed the peasantry to establish a strong army. He made an unsuccessful attempt to transfer his capital from Delhi to Dolatabad in the Deccan. He also made elaborate plans to conquer Persia and Iraq, but had to abandon the plan. To make matters worse, he introduced a token currency to deal with the financial crisis without taking any steps to make minting of coins a monopoly of the government. This caused further problems in the economy. His failed plans severely depleted the country's resources. Firoz Shah Tughlaq The result of Muhammad bin Tughlaq's schemes was that the dynasty lost credibility and the treasury was exhausted. As a result, rebellions broke out throughout the country. Muhammad bin Tughlaq was succeeded by his cousin Firoz Shah Tughlaq in 1351 CE. Firoz Shah Tughlaq was a just and fair ruler. He is remembered for his welfare schemes. He introduced significant changes in the economic and judicial system. He was a patron of learning and architecture. He built many towns and buildings of public utility, such as schools and colleges. However, he lacked the basic qualities of a military leader and was unable to recover the independent provinces. The End of the Tughlaq Dynasty The death of Firoz Shah in 1388 CE was followed by the disintegration of the Delhi Sultanate. The final blow to the Sultanate was dealt by Timur Lane, the Mongol ruler of Samarkand in Central Asia. Timur invaded India in 1398-99 CE. He returned to Samarkand with his Indian loot as he had no ambitions of ruling India. When he left India, Timur left behind his Khan as his viceroy. Khan overthrew the last Tughlaq ruler and established the Sayyid and Lodi dynasties. The Sayyids ruled for 38 years, after which the Lodi rulers from Afghanistan established their rule in India. The Lodi dynasty was founded by Behlul Lodi in 1451 CE. The most famous of the Lodi rulers was Sikandar Lodi. He was succeeded by the arrogant and impulsive ruler Ibrahim Lodi. Ibrahim Lodi was killed by Babur, the founder of the Mughal dynasty in 1526 CE during the Battle of Panipat. This marked the end of the Delhi Sultanate and the beginning of a period of Mughal rule in India. The Mughal Dynasty, 1529 CE to 1857 CE. Babur. Babur, the king of Kabul, was a descendant of the powerful Mongol conquerors Timur and Chengiz Khan. In 1524 CE, he was invited to invade India by Daulat Khan Lodi to help him overthrow Ibrahim Lodi, the Sultan of Delhi. Babur overtook Punjab and in 1526 CE, defeated Ibrahim Lodi in the First Battle of Panipat. Babur was then proclaimed the Emperor of Hindustan. He was the first Mughal Emperor and the founder of the Mughal rule in India. Babur died in 1530 CE. His memoir, Tuzuk-i-Baburi or Babur Nama, 
is an invaluable source of information, which tells us a lot about Babar's life and achievements. Humayu. Humayu, Babar's eldest son, succeeded him as the Mughal emperor in 1530 CE. His empire stretched from Kabul in the west to Bihar in the east, from the Himalayas in the north to Gwalior in the south. But it was an unstable and weak empire. He was a capable soldier, but a poor general. Humayu and Sher Shah in 1540 CE, Sher Khan, an Afghan chief, defeated Humayu in the Battle of Chosa and in the Battle of Kannauj, and occupied the throne of Delhi in 1540 CE under the title of Sher Shah. Between 1540 CE and 1545 CE, Sher Shah conquered Malwa, Rajputana, Multan, Sindh and Punjab. In 1545 CE, he died in an accidental explosion of gunpowder. Within 10 years of Sher Shah's death, Humayu recaptured Delhi and Agra in 1555 CE, but died shortly afterwards. Humayu died in 1556 CE. He was a learned man, well-versed in various languages and subjects. His sister Gulbadan wrote his biography, Humayu Nama, which is a valuable source of information. Akbar. Akbar, the eldest son of Humayu, was one of the greatest rulers of India. He succeeded Humayu to the throne in 1556 CE at the age of 13. Bairam Khan, Humayu's experienced general, became Akbar's regent and looked after the affairs of the government on Akbar's behalf. In 1560 CE, at the age of 18, Akbar assumed absolute power. He embarked on a policy of conquest and annexation, aiming to bring the entire country under his control. Akbar's Conquests In 1562 CE, Akbar annexed Malwa. The ruler of Malwa, Baz Bahadur, was later on given a high post in Akbar's court. In 1564 CE, Akbar captured Gondwana, despite stiff resistance put up by Queen Durgavati. He entered into matrimonial alliances with the Rajputs, since he realized that they would be of great help in strengthening and expanding the Mughal Empire. He married the daughter of the Raja of Jaipur. Chittor, the capital of Mewar, was captured by Akbar's military forces. This was followed by the fall of Ranthambor. By 1570 CE, almost all the Rajput princes had accepted Akbar as their overlord. In 1572 CE, Akbar conquered Gujarat, which was a rich province. He annexed Bengal in 1574 CE to 1576 CE, which again was one of the most fertile and richest provinces in India. The conquest and annexation of Bengal brought rich revenues to the Mughal treasury. He conquered Kabul, Kashmir, Kandhar, Lower Sindh and Eastern Baluchistan between 1585 CE and 1595 CE. He conquered the Deccan between 1596 CE to 1601 CE. Akbar's administration. The Mughal administration under Akbar was highly centralized and the emperor's word was law. There were several departments such as the revenue department, military department, legal department and the department looking after the royal household. Akbar organized his nobility and army into the Mansabdari system. Under this system, each officer known as Mansabdar had to maintain a certain number of men, horses and elephants, 
according to his rank, called Mansab. Akbar also reformed the land revenue system. He was assisted by a group of ministers and officials known as the Nine Gems or Navratnas. The famous Nine Gems were Abul Fazal, Fezi, Abdul Rahim, Tan Singh, Todar Mal, Birbal, Raja Man Singh, Hamam, and Mulla Do Piazza. Akbar's religious policy. Akbar followed a policy of religious tolerance or Sumahi Kul. He built the Ibadat Khana or Hall of Prayer for religious discussions and invited scholars and priests of all religions to participate in the discussions. In 1582 CE, Akbar formed a new religious order, Din e Ilahi or Divine Faith. The objective was to establish a religious order acceptable to all religions could eventually promote universal brotherhood and national unity. Social and Cultural Achievements Under Akbar Akbar introduced many social reforms. He prohibited sati and discouraged child marriage. He reformed the educational system by laying emphasis on secular subjects. He encouraged writers and artists. Abul Fazal, Akbar's court historian, wrote Akbar Nama in Persian. During Akbar's reign, Tulsi Das wrote Ram Charitamanis. Many buildings were constructed under Akbar's patronage. He founded a new city near Agra and called it Patehpur Sikri. Some of his well-known buildings are Buland Darwaza, Panch Mehel, Ibadat Khana and Agra Fort. Akbar died in 1605 CE. With his death, the most glorious period of Indian history came to an end. Jahangir. Akbar's son Jahangir ascended the Mughal throne in 1605 CE. Jahangir did not introduce any significant changes in the administrative system and continued pursuing Akbar's policies. He conquered Mewar and Kangra but lost Kandhar to the Persians. In 1611, Jahangir married Nur Jahan. She was ambitious and soon became the power behind the throne. However, after Jahangir's death in 1627 CE, she retired from public life. Jahangir was a benevolent and just ruler. He was a nature lover and a scholar of zoology, botany and medicine. He was also a great patron of painting, music and architecture. Jahangir died in 1627 CE. Shah Jahan. Jahangir's son Shah Jahan ascended the Mughal throne in 1628 CE and ruled till 1657 CE. Shah Jahan was determined to consolidate the Mughal Empire by bringing the Deccan under his control. The three important states in the Deccan were Ahmednagar, Bijapur and Golconda. All of these states accepted the suzerainty of the Mughal Emperor. He is remembered for the magnificent buildings he constructed. The most famous is the Taj Mahal in Agra. His reign is considered to be the golden age of the Mughal Empire. It was politically united, economically prosperous and culturally vibrant.
Mughal Architectural Gems, Taj Mahal Agra, Red Fort Delhi, Jama Masjid Delhi, Aurangzeb. Shah Jahan's son Aurangzeb ascended the Mughal throne in 1658 CE. During his 50-year reign, the Mughal Empire became the single largest state India had ever known. However, he faced many rebellions from various groups and out of the different groups, the Marathas posed a serious challenge. Under the leadership of Shivaji, the Marathas established an independent kingdom in Deccan, which became a major military threat to the Mughal authority. Aurangzeb was an ideal person in many ways. His policy of discrimination on grounds of faith made him unpopular. However, he was unsuccessful as a sovereign. He died in 1707 CE. Decline of the Mughal Empire By 1707 CE, the Mughal Empire extended from Kashmir in the north to Jinji in the south and from the Hindu Kush in the west to Chittagong in the east. After Aurangzeb, his successors were weak and inefficient. The last of the Mughal emperors in India was Bahadur Shah Zafar II, who ruled from 1837 CE to 1857 CE. In the mid-18th century, the Mughal Empire slowly disintegrated. As the rulers were incompetent, the nobles, who were divided into factions, exerted great control over their rulers. As a result, invaders like Nadir Shah of Persia and Ahmad Shah Abdali of Afghanistan repeatedly raided Delhi, the Mughal capital, and left northern India in ruins. The Mughal Empire had lasted for over three centuries. Its decline led to intense rivalry among various ambitious powers to fill the political vacuum. The struggle ended with the victory of the British who ruled India for nearly 200 years. The Revolt of 1857. The Great Revolt of 1857, or the First War of Indian Independence, was a result of the resentment and anger against the unjust and exploitative British government in India. It was the first great and direct threat that shook the foundations of the British rule in India. Causes of the Revolt of 1857 The Revolt of 1857 was caused by the cumulative effect of the discontent that was brewing in the minds of the people. The causes of the Revolt of 1857 can be broadly classified into political causes, economic causes, social and religious causes, military causes and finally the immediate cause. political causes, the aggressive expansionist policy of the British and the indiscriminate annexation of Indian states created resentment, mistrust, suspicion and fear 
among the Indian rulers and their subjects. The annexation of Awadh, in spite of the loyalty of the Nawab, created panic. Nana Sahib was denied his pension and forced to leave Pune. Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal emperor, lived in Delhi as a pensioner of the British. Economic causes. The peasants were distressed by the land revenue systems that made excessive demands on them. They lost their rights and were often evicted from land. To add to the problems, there were 12 major and several minor famines between 1770 and 1857. The decline of the handicraft industry led to too much pressure on land. The drain of wealth, lack of modern industries, and unemployment added to the economic grievances of the people. The interests of the Indian economy were sacrificed for British trade and industry. The traditional handicrafts industry collapsed. Nothing was done by the government to develop modern Indian industries. The annexation of states led to large-scale unemployment and economic distress. Social and religious causes. The orthodox sections of the society deeply resented social reforms such as the abolition of sati and the widow remarriage act. The British looked down upon the Indians and followed a policy of racial discrimination. The Indians felt threatened by the activities of the Christian missionaries who tried to convert people. The introduction of Western education undermined the position of the Indian priestly class. Military causes. The Indian sepoys had helped the British establish their empire in India, but they were neither appreciated nor rewarded for their efforts. There was grave discrimination between an Indian sepoy and his British counterpart. The Indian soldiers were paid less than the British soldiers. In 1856, an act was passed which required all new recruits to serve overseas if required. This hurt the sentiments of the Hindus because they believed that overseas travel would lead to loss of caste. After annexation of Awadh, the Nawab's army was disbanded. The soldiers lost their means of livelihood and their bitterness against the British increased. The Indian soldiers greatly outnumbered the British soldiers. This emboldened the sepoys to take up arms against their masters. Immediate cause. The new Enfield rifle cartridges introduced by the British to the ammunition had a greased paper cover that had to be bitten off before loading the rifle. The cartridges were rumoured to be greased with pig and cow fat. This enraged the Indian sepoys, who 
who felt that the British were deliberately trying to defile their religion. On 29th March 1857, Mangal Pandey, a sepoy, refused to use the cartridge and attacked his senior officers. He was hanged to death. Main Events of the Revolt On 9th May 1857, 85 soldiers in Meerut refused to use the new rifles and were sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Enraged by the humiliating treatment of their comrades, the sepoys of Meerut army rose in revolt. The sepoys stormed the jail and freed their comrades and attacked their European officers. The sepoys then marched to Delhi, where they were joined by the local sepoys. Bahadur Shah Zafar was proclaimed Emperor of Hindustan. The success of the revolt proved to be short-lived. The British recaptured Delhi and Bahadur Shah was exiled to Rangoon. Soon, the revolt spread like fire to other parts of the country such as Lucknow, Kanpur, Jhansi and Gwalior. Main centers of the revolt of 1857. Nana Sahib rose in revolt in Kanpur with the help of Tantya Tope. The sepoys of Lucknow were joined by the disbanded army of the Nawab. Rani Lakshmibai fought gallantly in Jhansi and Gwalior. The revolt was crushed by the British by July 1858, 14 months after the outbreak at Meerut. Results of the Revolt of 1857 The rule of the East India Company came to an end. India came under the direct rule of the British Parliament and the Queen of England, Queen Victoria. The new government announced that the treaties with Indian states would be honoured. The doctrine of lapse was abolished. The right to adopt sons as legal heirs was acknowledged. The army was reorganized and strengthened. It was also decided that the Indians would be given opportunities to take part in the administration. The British government said that it would not interfere in the social and religious customs of the people. A general pardon was granted to all the rebels except those who had killed the British. Growth of Indian Nationalism Growth of Indian Nationalism The second half of the 19th century saw the growth of nationalism in India. Causes of the Rise of Nationalism Modern Indian nationalism was a reaction to the oppressive and exploitative nature of the British rule and the clash of interests of the Indian people with those of the British. The British introduced Western education in India. This created a small new class of English educated Indians who would be leaders and organizers of a national movement.
Western education also helped in the spread of new ideas like nationalism, democracy and liberty, which motivated the Indians to struggle for freedom. The English language acted as a link language between various parts of the country. It fostered feelings of unity among the educated Indians. The British introduced roads, railways and the post and telegraph system, which brought the people of India closer. The research carried out by Indologists about India's glorious past and rich heritage instilled in the Indians feelings of national pride. The vernacular press played a vital role in spreading modern ideas and creating national awareness. The British destroyed Indian industries and drained the country's wealth and followed discriminatory policies. This led to impoverishment of the masses, industrial decay and grinding poverty. The discriminatory policies adopted by the British at the social, political and economic level were greatly resented by the Indian intellectuals. All important positions in the administration were also reserved for the British. Lord Ripon approved of the Ilbert Bill, which allowed Indian judges to try Europeans accused of crimes. The violent reaction of the Europeans and the Anglo-Indians to the Ilbert Bill shocked the Indian nationalists. The bill had to be amended. This incident served as an eye-opener and drove home the urgent need to form an organized national body to protect the interest and dignity of the Indians. In 1883, Surendranath Banerjee held the Indian National Conference and within two years, the Indian National Congress was born. Indian National Congress the initiative to set up an All India Organization was taken up by Alan Octavian Hume, a retired British official of the civil service. He was supported by important nationalist Indian leaders. Alan Octavian Hume laid the foundation of the Indian National Congress in December 1885. The first session of the Congress was held in Bombay in 1885. The history of the Indian National Congress can be divided into three phases. Moderate phase, 1885 to 1905. Assertive Nationalist phase, 1905 to 1918. Gandhian phase, 1918 to 47. The Moderates. The members of the Congress during the Moderate phase belonged to the educated middle class intellectual community. The important leaders during the moderate phase were Dada Bhai Nauroji, Surendranath Banerjee, and Gopal Krishna Gokhale. The moderates wanted to remain under the British, but with proper participation of Indians in the government in the near future. The moderates presented their grievances to the government and waited patiently for them to take steps. The Assertive Nationalists The transition in the national movement marked the beginning of the second phase of the national movement. It was known as the Assertive Nationalist Phase, which was led by Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai, Bibin. Bal Gangadhar Tilak knew that the British would never concede to the demand for Swaraj without a struggle. A more assertive method of active opposition to the government would have to be adopted. The assertive nationalists realized 
that Swaraj could only be achieved through a political, anti-government agitation and with the involvement and support of the masses. Following their policy of divide and rule, the British partitioned Bengal in 1905. After the partition of Bengal in 1905 by the British, the assertive nationalists adopted the methods of boycott, Swadeshi movement and national education to achieve the goal of Swaraj. The people were asked to boycott all British goods and use only Indian or Swadeshi goods. The assertive nationalists also saw through the evil designs of the British in dividing Bengal on communal lines. This was done to separate the Hindus from the Muslims and destroy the unity between them. The Muslim League The Muslim League was established in December 1906 under the leadership of Nawab Salim Mullah Khan in Dhaka. Muhammad Ali Jinnah joined the Muslim League in 1913. The Muslim League wanted to protect and promote the political rights of the Muslims. It also wanted to promote loyalty towards the British government. In 1906, it appealed to the Viceroy for separate electorates, that is, Muslim voters would elect Muslim representatives. Mahatma Gandhi Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born in 1869 at Purbandar in Gujarat. He had studied law in England and spent 22 years in South Africa as a practicing lawyer. The racial discrimination and the humiliating conditions under which Indians lived in that country shocked and angered Gandhiji. He became a leader of a struggle against racial discrimination in South Africa. Gandhian Methods Satyagraha During the struggle, Gandhiji evolved a technique called Satyagraha, which was later applied to the Indian National Movement. Satyagraha was based on the twin principles of truth and non-violence. A Satyagrahi was expected to follow peaceful methods under extreme provocation. He believed that non-violence could be used to resist armed attacks by the enemy. Non-cooperation Gandhiji's non-violent methods of struggle in India consisted of non-cooperation with the British government. This included peaceful demonstration, defiance of unjust laws, boycott of British goods, the use of charkha and khadi to promote self-reliance, non-payment of oppressive taxes, mass movement. Gandhiji promoted Hindu-Muslim unity. Under his leadership, the Indian national movement was transformed into a mass movement. He championed the cause of the lower castes, whom he called Harijans. Gandhiji returned to India in 1915 and was involved in the national politics.
During the World War years, Gandhiji encouraged Indians to support the British government in hope of getting home rule after the war. By 1919, Gandhiji had become the center stage of national politics and had become very popular among the masses. Indian independence and partition. Events leading to the independence and partition. The British government adopted the policy of repression to crush anti-British movement against the repressive Rowlatt Act of 1919, which empowered the government to arrest and imprison a person without any trial. Hartals were held in some places which led to violence. Two popular nationalist leaders had been arrested in Punjab. To protest against the arrest of their leaders, a public meeting was held on 13th April 1919. General Dyer, the military commander... Jallianwala Bagh tragedy. General Dyer surrounded the Bagh with his troops, blocked the only exit, and ordered the troops to open fire on the unarmed and peaceful gathering in the Bagh. The shooting continued till there was no ammunition left. Nearly 400 people were killed and over 1,000 were injured. Many jumped into the well in the Bagh to escape the bullets as there was no way out. Martial law was proclaimed in Punjab. During this period, people were humiliated and tortured. The inhuman treatment of the Indians shocked the entire nation. The Non-Cooperation Movement, 1920 after the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, Gandhiji lost all faith in the, <coughs> of the British government and declared that it would be a sin to cooperate with the government. The non-cooperation movement was launched by Gandhiji in 1920. The ultimate goal was to attain Swaraj by peaceful and legitimate means. The program of non-cooperation and the methods of resistance were as follows. Boycott of foreign goods. Boycott of government institutions, schools, colleges, law courts and legislatures. Boycott of elections and government functions. Renunciation of titles and honours awarded by the British. Constructive programmes like Swadeshi and Hindu-Muslim unity also became a part of the movement. Gandhiji stressed the importance of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. He popularized Khadi among the people, including the upper classes. The Charkha became the symbol of Swadeshi. National education was promoted. In 1922, a procession of peasants were fired upon by the police at Chori Chora. People reacted violently and burnt down the police <coughs> station. Gandhiji called off the movement. Lahore Session of the Congress, 1929. 
In December 1929, the Congress met in Lahore under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru. The Congress passed a resolution declaring Purna Swaraj, or complete independence, as its goal, and 26 January 1930 was fixed as the Independence Day. They also resolved to launch a civil disobedience movement under the leadership of Gandhiji. On 26 January 1930, Independence Day was celebrated all over the country. The newly adopted Indian tricolor was unfurled and people solemnly took the Pledge of Freedom. This continued every year till India finally became free in 1947. The Civil Disobedience Movement 1930-34 The Civil Disobedience Movement launched in 1930 was a form of non-cooperation. Its objective was to defy the government and pressurize it to give in to their demands. The movement was launched by Gandhiji in March 1930 with the Salt Satyagraha. He decided to start with the breaking of the unjust salt law because it affected everybody in the country. Indians had to pay salt tax and could not manufacture it as it was a government monopoly. The Salt Satyagraha started with the Dandi March. Gandhiji set out from Sabarmati Ashram with 78 followers on a 385-kilometer journey to the coastal village of Dandi. Thousands joined him on the way. On reaching Dandi, he picked up some salt from the beach. This act symbolized the defiance of the salt law. The civil disobedience movement spread rapidly. It included violation of laws, refusal to pay taxes, boycott of foreign goods, hartals, demonstrations, and picketing of shops selling foreign goods. Women participated in large numbers in the movement. Sarojini Naidu was one of the leaders of the movement. The government repressed the movement with force and brutality. Gandhiji, Nehru, and all the other important leaders were arrested. The political activity in India became increasingly intense after 1935. The Quit India Movement <coughs> On 8th August 1942, Gandhiji declared that they would free India or die in the attempt. He gave the do or die mantra. The Congress passed the Quit India Resolution. On 9th August, important nationalist leaders were arrested. The Congress was banned. The news of these arrests, even before the movement began, shocked the nation. Leaderless and without any guidelines, the movement turned violent in parts. The government came down heavily on the people and crushed the movement in a short time. The upsurge of 1942 was the last great mass challenge to British authority. It demonstrated how much the masses were willing to suffer to gain freedom. It was clear that the days of the British government in India were numbered. Nationalist activity, however, surfaced outside India's borders under the leadership of Subhash Chandra Bose. 
who believed that the British would have to be driven out. The Indian National Army Subhash Chandra Bose resigned from the Congress in 1939. He formed a new party called the Forward Bloc. He wanted to join hands with Britain's enemies. He was arrested, but he escaped to Japan. He took on the leadership of the Indian National Movement in East Asia and became the Supreme Commander of the Indian National Army, INA. The INA crossed the Indo-Burma border with the Japanese army and liberated Imphal and Kohima. However, Japan was defeated in World War II and it is generally believed that Subhash Chandra Bose was killed in a plane crash on the way to Tokyo but is still celebrated in India for his heroism. In February 1947, the British government declared that power would be transferred to the Indians by June 1948. Lord Mountbatten, the British Viceroy, prepared a plan for transfer of power. Indian Independence and Partition of India Lord Mountbatten announced that British India would be divided into two independent nations, India and Pakistan. The Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh, Baluchistan, West Punjab and East Bengal separated from the rest of India to form a new country called Pakistan. British rule in India finally came to an end on 15th August 1947. The Indians celebrated their independence, but it was marred by communal violence during the partition. Millions of people had to migrate, Muslims from India to Pakistan and Hindus from Pakistan. On 30th January 1948, Gandhiji was assassinated. The Constitution of India was enacted and adopted on 26th November 1949. It was introduced on 26 January 1950. On that day, the Indian Dominion was transformed into a sovereign democratic republic. Indian independence and partition.
events leading to the independence and partition. The British government adopted the policy of repression to crush anti-British movement against the repressive Rowlatt Act of 1919, which empowered the government to arrest and imprison a person without any trial. Hartals were held in some places which led to violence. Two popular nationalist leaders had been arrested in Punjab. To protest against the arrest of their leaders, a public meeting was held on 13th April 1919. General Dyer, the military commander of Amritsar, had banned all public meetings. Janiawala Bagh Tragedy General Dyer surrounded the bar with his troops, blocked the only exit, and ordered the troops to open fire on the unarmed and peaceful gathering in the bar. The shooting continued till there was no ammunition left. Nearly 400 people were killed and over 1,000 were injured. Many jumped into the well in the bar to escape the bullets as there was no way out. Martial law was proclaimed in Punjab. During this period, people were humiliated and tortured. The inhuman treatment of the Indians shocked the entire nation. The Non-Cooperation Movement, 1920 after the Janiawala Bagh massacre, Gandhiji lost all faith in the goodness of the British government and declared that it would be a sin to cooperate with the government. The non-cooperation movement was launched by Gandhiji in 1920. The ultimate goal was to attain Swaraj by peaceful and legitimate means. The program of non-cooperation and the methods of resistance were as follows. Boycott of foreign goods. Boycott of government institutions, schools, colleges, law courts and legislatures. Boycott of elections and government functions. Renunciation of titles and honours awarded by the British. Constructive programs like Swadeshi and Hindu-Muslim unity also became a part of the movement. Gandhiji stressed the importance of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. He popularized Khadi among the people, including the upper classes. The Charkha became the symbol of Swadeshi. National education was promoted. In 1922, a procession of peasants were fired upon by the police at Chori Chora. People reacted violently and burnt down the police station. Gandhiji called off the movement. Lahore Session of the Congress 1929 In December 1929, the Congress met in Lahore under the leadership of Jawaharlal Nehru. The Congress passed a resolution declaring Purna Swaraj, or complete independence, as its goal, and 26 January 1930 was fixed as the Independence Day. They also resolved to launch a civil disobedience movement under the leadership of Gandhiji. On 26 January 1930, Independence Day was celebrated all over the country. The newly adopted Indian tricolor was unfurled and people solemnly took the Pledge of Freedom. This continued every year till India finally became free in 1947. The Civil Disobedience Movement 1930-34 The Civil Disobedience Movement launched in 1930 was a form of non-cooperation. Its objective was to defy the government and pressurize it to give in to their demands. The movement was launched by Gandhiji in March 1930 with the Salt Satyagraha. He decided to start with the breaking of the unjust salt law because it affected everybody in the country. Indians had to pay salt tax and could not manufacture it as it was a government monopoly. The Salt Satyagraha started with the Dandi March. 
Gandhi ji set out from Sabarmati ashram with 78 followers on a 385 km journey to the coastal village of Dandi. Thousands joined him on the way. On reaching Dandi, he picked up some salt from the beach. This act symbolized the defiance of the salt law. The civil disobedience movement spread rapidly. It included violation of laws, refusal to pay taxes, boycott of foreign goods, hartals, demonstrations, and picketing of shops selling foreign goods. Women participated in large numbers in the movement. Sarojini Naidu was one of the leaders of the movement. The government repressed the movement with force and brutality. Gandhiji, Nehru, and all the other important leaders were arrested. The political activity in India became increasingly intense after 1935. The Quit India Movement On 8 August 1942, Gandhiji declared that they would free India or die in the attempt. He gave the do or die mantra. The Congress passed the Quit India Resolution. On 9 August, important nationalist leaders were arrested. The Congress was banned. The news of these arrests, even before the movement began, shocked the nation. Leaderless and without any guidelines, the movement turned violent in parts. The government came down heavily on the people and crushed the movement in a short time. The upsurge of 1942 was the last great mass challenge to British authority. It demonstrated how much the masses were willing to suffer to gain freedom. It was clear that the days of the British government in India were numbered. Nationalist activity, however, surfaced outside India's borders under the leadership of Subhash Chandra Bose, who believed that the British would have to be driven out by the use of armed force. The Indian National Army Subhash Chandra Bose resigned from the Congress in 1939. He formed a new party called the Forward Bloc. He wanted to join hands with Britain's enemies. He was arrested but he escaped to Japan. He took on the leadership of the Indian National Movement in East Asia and became the Supreme Commander of the Indian National Army, INA. The INA crossed the Indo-Burma border with the Japanese army and liberated Imphal and Kohima. However, Japan was defeated in World War II and it is generally believed that Subhash Chandra Bose was killed in a plane crash on the way to Tokyo but is still celebrated in India for his heroism. In February 1947, the British government declared that power would be transferred to the Indians by June 1948. Lord Mountbatten, the British Viceroy, prepared a plan for transfer of power. Indian Independence and Partition of India Lord Mountbatten announced that British India would be divided into two independent nations, India and Pakistan. The Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh, Baluchistan, West Punjab and East Bengal separated from the rest of India to form a new country called Pakistan. British rule in India finally came to an end on 15th August 1947. The Indians celebrated their independence, but it was marred by communal violence during the partition. Millions of people had to migrate, Muslims from India to Pakistan and Hindus from Pakistan. On 30th January 1948, Gandhiji was assassinated. The Constitution of India was enacted and adopted on 26 November 1949. It was introduced on 26 January 1950. On that day, the Indian Dominion was transformed into a sovereign democratic republic.